Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. The screaming Nord Lead 2 synthesizer, one of the many keyboards you'll hear on today's show. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm here with keyboard playing Michael Kester. I have been known to play a keyboard once or twice in on my life. On occasion, I guess. Yeah. And uh, man, just fucking ready to... Today's feature, I guess, is uh, a beep boop, beep boop. That's about yeah, that's all I have. Yeah, that's pretty good. This is, in fact, double feature. There are going to be two movies. Mm-hmm. And uh, why don't you go ahead and tell everybody what those goddamn Tron? movies are? What, which, what's the first one? We're going to do Tron. And- so the, the one from like last year that has the stuff and the things? No, the, the like Tron. Oh, due to Disney's Brain Wipe. I've never actually heard of that right. film. So yeah. that should be interesting. And then we're going to do Scott Pilgrim versus the World. Oh, my God. So we have some fucking spoilers. Uh, we're going to spoil both movies, of course, but I think we're going to talk a little bit about uh, both the original Tron and some Tron Legacy stuff. Uh huh. We'll sprinkle it throughout, yes. let's say. Uh, so if you really give a shit about what happens in either of those movies, and you don't, then you can use the chapters to skip over to Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Yep. Probably the last time I'll use the full title of that okay. film. Also, I'll be really honest with you, I'm going to talk about arcades a lot. And totally understand if you get bored with that, use the fucking chapters, skip to the next movie. I'm really excited about the show today because normally I'm the only one who geeks out on the show. Right. And I have to excuse myself all the time uh-huh. when I talk about something technical or nerdy. And uh, I think that's just the, that's the fucking core of both of these movies. Yeah, absolutely. Right? Absolutely. You know, every time we mention a video game on the show, there's seriously a mass exodus of our listenership. Yeah. You can see that in in the traffic numbers on our website, in the iTunes feed. People leave, about two thirds of our audience leaves Mm -hmm. every time we make a video game reference. Yep. Even now that I've used the term video game twice, I would say nine tenths of our listenership has shut off their, their portable music playing device. My point was that uh, I don't like being told what to do, and I know you're probably not a fan of that either, so fuck those people who already left, who probably didn't download the show to begin with. We're just going to have to talk some games today. Yeah. If you want one of those shows that's heavy and real message and uh, cute computers and AI, and watch Colossus. Yeah, we did that with uh, Colossus and uh, Planet of the Apes. That was that show. Go back and listen to that show. You didn't watch Colossus, The Forbin Project. I know you didn't watch it. So go back and watch that movie and listen to that show. But for now, it's fucking Tron time. So a long time ago, we said uh, Disney films on the show. right. Is that what this is? Yeah, no. I I mean, kind of. I think it's cheating that this is our first Disney film. That's exactly the way we should do it. It's it's kind of the black sheep of the Disney films. Um, It's more like the glowing blue sheep. I was going to say the black sheep of the Disney films are the incredibly racist cartoons that they decided to kind of pull off shelves and not release on DVD. But this is our way of doing a Disney film. Mm -hmm. We're going to sort of pick, I don't even know if I would call Tron the underdog. No. It's a weird spot it's in now because of Tron Legacy. Yeah, well, also it's mass cult appeal, which apparently it, I still don't understand. That puts it in double feature territory, yeah, though, for doesn't sure. it? Yeah, the cult appeal could come from an, uh, a couple places, I guess. It comes from a uh, little nostalgia, uh-huh. which we'll talk about that today. Yep. And uh, I, yeah, I think that's the only place the cult there's appeal gotta comes be, from. There's got to be some other thing that makes people really latch on to Tron, but I don't have it. It's not in my brain. Well, so there's a lot of notable stuff it does. Mm-hmm. So we have cult appeal. We got notable stuff. Totally double feature worthy. Absolutely. Uh, right away. But beyond that, I know people, uh, people our age, people who didn't grow up with Tron particularly, who loved the movie, had never seen it before, you know, recent years. And uh, and who aren't in it because it was the first movie to do this mm-hmm. or, you know, I guess those are the two reasons, right? Yeah. First movie to do this or nostalgia. I don't know why I can't. I've tried to get coherent reasons out of these people, but there's several of them. And so there's an audience for this movie even today. So it's a film that's, I mean, it's only kind of Disney. You know, it's the... It's PG, I mean, or G-rated. That's Disney enough for me. I mean, if if a film is PG or G-rated, that just, as far as I'm concerned, it's Disney. It might as well be Disney, yeah. even if Disney Co. did not have anything to do with yeah. it. 
you know, the financial backing and uh, basically the script edits mm-hmm. came from Disney. So they decided, you know, we'll uh, we'll pay for this movie. They were essentially the producer. Sure. But they wouldn't help with anything beyond the money. Uh-huh. When uh, the people who made Tron actually went to them to ask about animation, they said, fuck it. Animators, we don't have any of those here. Don't yeah. know what you're talking about, man. Disney is not an animation-based company. Yeah, we don't have an animation studio. We cannot help you. So they turned to the machine. This is often cited as the original film to really use CGI. Uh, and when I say CGI, I want to make that distinction, too. We talked about that before. Mm-hmm. Uh, not computer enhancements, right. but actually computer-generated imagery. Right. Things uh, completely created from the machine. Like a light cycle? Yeah, like the light cycle scenes. And, you know, not even a lot of the backgrounds of the movie, because backgrounds, matte painting, that stuff has existed since people were using cars in movies. Mm-hmm. Since fucking Metropolis, right? I mean, that stuff's existed for a long time. But this isn't just using computers to make a funny background and put it into the movie. Mm-hmm. This is uh, generating objects that move inside your film that are completely made by computers. The, you know, the bit, the light cycles, basically anytime anything computer animated also moves. There's motion right, as well. Right. That kind of animation I would consider computer generated imagery. And I think Tron should get a huge credit for bringing computers into movies. It should also get an equal discredit for bringing computers into movies. I was just going to say, that's not always been a great thing. Right. But in rare occasions, it's done some pretty great stuff. Well, yeah, I would definitely say that, and I've always said this, that there is a place in film for computer generation. When did you say that? I've never heard that out of your fucking mouth. I've always thought that like, you can use it. Don't use it in lieu of something that would oh, sure. clearly make a better decision right don't don't do it because it's easy don't do it because it's an easy way out and yeah you know it looks good enough we talked about this back what last year when we did lawnmower man in jurassic park sure and any movie that's ever had models dark yeah. city comes to mind sure so i mean if you want to hear that conversation at nauseum go back to one of those shows but essentially i don't like cg it's a doesn't stand up uh, over time thing. Exactly. You know, it's funny because the, the idea, by the way, to do Tron and Scott Pilgrim, that's going to totally seem like my idea. Mm-hmm. I can't take any credit for that. That, yeah, that was, was all you, sir. Yeah, that was my idea. And uh, you didn't even have Tron. <laughs> so nope. you told me, you said, uh, Eric, I know you don't have Tron, but we need to get that so we can watch it on the show, which isn't usually how this shit works. Yeah. I would say most times one of us has it. Um, not all the time, but most times, or at least we know there's a conversation there. You said Tron, and that was out of left field. Right? Uh-huh. So I actually got us an HD copy yeah, because you did. I thought that would be the funniest fucking thing in the and universe. It, it was funny for the first maybe 45 minutes. And then it was terrifying. Yep. So terrifying. So I enjoy the parts of Tron that other people probably hate. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody thinks of Tron and thinks about the fucking costume, the Tron the, guy, the light stuff. Yeah, all that stuff. And I really, really love the live action parts of Tron. Mm-hmm. The uh, I guess they're all live action. You know, the thing's done on a soundstage. So, hey, credit for a soundstage movie, hey. too. When we're going around saying Sin City, the first thing created on a sound, well, that's clearly not true. There was a lot of soundstage stuff in, uh, in Tron, although it wasn't made 100% on a soundstage. Still pretty cool. But the parts I like are the beginning of the movie, mm-hmm. hanging out in Flynn's arcade. I like just being back in that arcade 80s atmosphere and uh, everything before going into the computer. And I realize for a lot of people, that's probably being in the private detective's office sure. in uh, Who right. Framed Roger Rabbit. Right. I mean, that's not, you know, that's not what you come to the film for. But God damn, I love those parts. It's prob- I've, I would definitely say that it's better than all of the defragging all the megabytes or whatever the fuck happens. Reboot. You know, when you think about the popular culture symbols that have come out of it, you think of stuff like Tron Guy. Tron Guy. Right? I don't know how much Tron Guy we really need to explain on the show. Uh, tr- j- Google. Google there's a man, and Tron Guy. There's a man in a Tron suit. That's really, I think, all that needs uh-huh. to be said. People have the internet. Sure. Uh, but also Moses from South Park. Right. Which is just the master computer. Master the fuck control. Master control, thank you, from, uh, from Tron. I don't, you know, I don't actually care about the pop icons. For me, the best thing about Tron... Uh, new or old, original Tron or Tron Legacy, 
is the fucking arcade culture. Yeah. Rarely do you have movies that are so... The only other one I can think of off the top of my head is The Wizard. I mean, you don't have a lot of movies about the arcade. Yeah. There really should be some kind of arcade exploitation, Uh but that genre does not yet exist. Yeah, it also doesn't really have a wide enough audience. I would buy every one of those movies. Yeah, I know, but you already discussed that most of our audience would turn away at even the the sight of the It's true. It's true. They hate it. Oh, God. And we'll get to that with Scott Pilgrim and that poor movie. So what I love about arcade culture is that it's really the only piece of my life, um, you know, this is just part of getting old, I guess, and this shit happens, that disappears over time. Mm -hmm. You know, when fucking old people talk about the way it used to be and the five cent candy bar and I don't even, I don't talk to old people, so I don't know what they- When I was your age? Right. But you're aware of these things, right? That used to exist in old people time Uh and don't exist anymore. Sure. And the only thing I've ever missed in my life that's disappeared. I'm all for forward technology. Mm-hmm. I love getting rid of the typewriter and entering the Apple II and getting rid of the Apple II and entering the fucking personal home computer. I love getting rid of CDs and replacing it with MP3s. Uh-huh. I'm all for forward pushing technology. However, the home console has destroyed the arcade. Yeah, There used to be these things that you went to called arcades yeah where you had absolutely all these, fantastic you had these every mall cabinets. remember when malls existed oh, every yeah. mall had an arcade those still exist you city living asshole there is one in chicago those i have, have to go arcade? there to i don't know i just go Not there to important. buy my uh mall pants i don't actually know <laughs> i really wish the people who listen to the show had any idea what we look like it's hilarious so you go to these arcades and you would spend, what would it take? Maybe $20 to play in the arcade? Oh, yeah. Or if I gave you $20, uh-huh. uh, Michael Kester Jr. to go to an arcade, right. how long could you play your favorite arcade game with 20 bucks? Oh. Give me a realistic figure. How long would that really last? Maybe an hour. Yeah, that's about an hour worth, right? <laughs> I mean, if you wanted to play in the arcades for two or three hours, you might spend 50 bucks. It depends on how good you are and it depends on what games you're playing. And it depends how the arcade dealers have the machines yeah, cranked. That's too. true. Because most arcades would have settings on them where mm-hmm. you could change the difficulty, otherwise known as the quarter sucker setting. And no one ever spent $50 in an arcade because you never hung out in an arcade actively playing for more than an hour. Right. You ran out of 20 bucks, and that's the point where you said, wow, that sucked. I wasted all that money. But then you would kind of walk around. Yeah, you'd and, still wander around. So you see, you see in Tron everybody watching him play Light Cycle. Yeah, right. And everybody's crowded around, and you think, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure he's such a great player that people are even spectating. Yeah, I get the point. But the thing is... Due to the nature of an arcade, mm-hmm. people would run out of money and their ride wouldn't be there to pick yep, them up. That's yet. it. So they would just have to kind of walk around and look at the coolest game, see people. We, we did the King of Kong. A yeah, while I was just ago. thinking about that. We didn't talk about arcade culture at all on that. And uh, it you just have people that are kind of watching other people do really well. It's all positive reinforcement. Nobody is there to fucking knock your score out. Right, and if they right. do, it's it's a challenge and not sure. a knockdown. It's honorable. And uh, it's all just, it's, everything is really positive. It, the only thing that, that really is negative about it is that you end up with a lot less money than you walked in there with and a lot fewer tickets than you needed for whatever prize you were hoping to get. Oh, God, and tick- I always despise the tickets. Me too. I would not play an arcade game that, wh- I think Whack-A-Mole was probably the most tickets yeah. I would ever go to an arcade for, but I always played... You know, the type of X-Men, four-person... Sure. The cabinet games. I was thinking of the the clones of... You know, they had the Simpsons one, and the, right. just clones of four people mm-hmm. would walk down a, a 2D platform, a street... With a and, vacuum cleaner? Yeah, right, and beat up whatever the enemy was. But then they also had the fighting games, which were great. Um, the And, you know, I think, again, of the, the Marvel stuff, um, but Marvel versus Capcom sure. or X-Men street versus Fighter, Street Fighter, Mortal all Kombat. that shit. Yeah, Tekken. Mortal Kombat was a great one. Mortal Kombat was an amazing arcade. But you had, the nature of it was, it was almost sports for nerds. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? There was, there was, it was like Nerd Olympics. There was a lot of spectating to yeah. it. People would gather around and that was just the nature of mm-hmm. hanging out in the arcade. It was almost like a, a bar with video games instead of alcohol. Right. And all of these people, a lot of which weren't very, uh, very social individuals. That was something you saw in the arcade a lot. People would just come right up next to you. They would stand right next to you and challenge you in a game. Mm-hmm. Sure. And the the game was set up in such a way where that's just how it works. Yep. You would have this immediate you know, physical proximity with a stranger you've never met before. And all of a sudden, you guys were both doing something together. That and was, they would kick your ass. Yeah, and they, they would. They would always kick your ass. Or you would beat them a few times. It would be a little awkward, and they would leave. Yeah. Or then you had those moments, too, the continue moments where you're running sure. out of quarters. Sure. 
and or tokens for the really fucking shady arcades. And you would, you know, try and flag your friend down to make you go get quarters uh-huh. while you're on your last life. Sure. God, I miss arcades. There's a moment in Tron Legacy that is kind of an homage back. It's a, um, it's Flynn's Arcade. And the first time the kid walks into Flynn's Arcade and, you know, he, every, everything is dusty and the power's not on and it hasn't been activated in years, but all the cabinets are still there. And in the beginning of the original Tron, you see a lot of, you know, a lot of that hanging out in Flynn's Arcade, no big deal. But in the new one, for whatever reason, the sound mix is just so incredible. Such high fidelity sound. Well, probably, probably because it's got a lot to do with Daft Punk. You know, there's no Daft Punk in this scene, but I think because the Daft Punk is such high resolution sure. audio and the right. rest of it, mm-hmm. they kind of had to, you know, up the ante for the measly arcade right, right, scene. Right, right, right. But when he throws the power on, you know, he hits the switch on the circuit breaker and every single arcade comes to life at the same time. It's the stuff you heard in King of Kong. It's uh, just the soundscape that doesn't exist anymore in reality, anywhere. It's not like anything you could ever hear. I mean, it's been recreated artificially through, uh, you know, through Game Room on Xbox or through um, when they promoted Tron Legacy, they actually had recreated Flynn's Arcade at a Comic-Con event or something. But just hearing all those arcade games make their own individual unique sounds, all pretty loud, and then just blending together, and you can identify individual pieces as if they're instruments individual machines and you know on top of that it's also it starts pumping journeys uh separate ways through the speakers and then there's a eurythmic song Mm -hmm. um sweet dreams starts playing and just the ambience of this huge room and the way the sound mixed together it's probably it's why i love synthesizers it's why there's a nord lead too in our stupid little theme thing Mm -hmm. i just love that fucking sound and I'm so glad that it's been, you know, reused in music yep. and in stuff like Scott Pilgrim, as we'll see, because you can't get it anywhere else. It's just faded out of, uh, there isn't an environment that recreates that. So as we're watching Tron, I'm trying to figure out uh, the message of yeah. Tron. What is Tron trying to say to us? And, you know, I can't pull a whole lot of anything out of it mm-hmm. outside of computer generated Olympics. Yeah. But there is that message early on about how computers will start thinking and people will stop. Sure. And, you know, because of the writing in Tron, the messages are never, they're clear when they're there, but I don't think they're that important. Right. But that's one of those things that, uh, that always kind of strikes me as bizarre that people, I mean, do you think as machines get smarter, people become stupid as a result? Has the home computer made people stupid? I know that my roommate, every time he leaves our apartment, will go onto Google Maps and google map the location that he is about to go to sure even if he's gone there three times earlier in the week right because he knows in his head he never has to remember where it is or how to get there because he can always google it but i don't necessarily think that makes him a less intelligent human being it just seems practical to me yeah see that's the thing that's strange to me is rather than needing to uh to know how to read a map for instance, Mm -hmm. or to carry a map with you at all times, or, you know, what you're talking about to just remember the street directions. I mean, I've lived in Chicago for years. I don't fucking understand the grid. I don't get the number system. When somebody says 3,600 North, but I don't know what the fuck that is. Mm -hmm. I can't, I still can't get to your apartment uh, or even to the studio we're in right now without using Google maps, despite the fact it seems like I come here every fucking day, but that's fine because I feel like I have space in my head now for knowledge other than these dumb things that I would... I mean, who needs to know how to get places? I do. If you, Well, if you run out of batteries on your sure. fucking cell phone or whatever, maybe. But if you have a map with you at all times, this just seems like it's the kind of claim that when the compass came out, people probably fucking lobbied. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, you can't look in the sky and tell where north is. Right. People are getting so fucking stupid. And we didn't even really know why north was north at the time. Science has progressed so far since then. Technology has progressed so far, and we can do so many more amazing things, you know, just like filmmaking, just like we're talking about Tron and computer-generated imagery. Mm -hmm. That doesn't seem lazy or pointless or stupid. Right. It seems like an advancement, and I think it's so fucking hypocritical for Tron to make their movie out of technology and then talk about how computers are making people stupid. Well, it seems like they weren't intentionally going to make make it from computers when they had originally put together the script. I think that was the goal. I don't mean to suggest that just because Disney wouldn't help them, they turn to computers. Yeah. I think that was always kind of the original intent. You know, I think uh, Pong and a lot of the arcade games were inspiration for that. What if people lived inside the machine? What would that look like? Not like Tron. 
So that gets to one of the, the strange art questions about this movie. It makes me really uncomfortable. And I'm not very good at articulating this because I've attempted to explain this to a couple people mm. now. Uh, so maybe you can help me with that. This started bugging me after I saw Tron Legacy. But on the original Tron, uh, it's, it's true as well. The post-production work on this movie was done by over 500 people, right? So you look at the movie, the reason it has all this acclaim and people remember it years later is because of the visuals, mm -hmm. you know, because of the odd art style and they film things, you know, in yeah. black and white on high contrast stuff and add in all the computer whatnot. And that is a style that is really unique to Tron. When we see something, we can say it looks like Tron. It's a Tron-like design. And we know that because of that art style. But that art style, this is the opposite of the usual thing we talk about all the time on our show. Mm -hmm. One man, one vision. You know, one guy went into his movie with a small crew and he did, you know, eight out of the 10 jobs. And so it's really the picture of the film he had in his head is what we're seeing on film. Mm -hmm. That's not the case with Tron. Tron is made by companies within departments within departments. And something about that makes me really uncomfortable. I don't know. I feel maybe it's because I feel like I can't congratulate someone on the job they did. Mm -hmm. You know, we do a movie on this show and we can usually congratulate the director. And even if there's uh, you know, great lighting to it, that yeah. maybe we congratulate the director on helping assign that lighting style or on the set that day making those choices. Uh, or we can congratulate the lighting department. Sure. But when you look at something like Tron and even more so Tron Legacy, there are so many, I mean, just rendering lighting effects on hair takes a crew of 12 people. Doesn't that just kind of become the daily grind? Isn't it just work at that point? Yeah. It seems less like art and more like an assignment. Sure. Can it, you imagine well, working, just imagine working uh, on a project, you're in a band with a lot of people, mm -hmm. you must already feel like the stuff you do kind of gets divided, it, it becomes out of your hands when all these people are yeah, collaborating right. on it. And I mean, you know, if you have, well, how many people are in your band? Seven. And how many people actually really write the music? I assume two. none of them listen to the show, so that this is okay. Two. Yeah, so two people write the music, uh -huh. yourself included? Yes. So what if you really had seven people writing the music? They would not be a very good band. Right. And and the songs would all be a little bit more generic. Nobody would really. You're right. I would come to I would come to rehearsal and do one seventh of the work I do. So it wouldn't be that much. My heart wouldn't be it would be one seventh as much in it as it is now. It almost seems and you like multiply a, that times 500. And right. It seems like a happy accident that movies like these come together. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire Hollywood system bugs me for that reason. Just because even when a, a movie is good, when you look at the art style from Tron and say, wow, that's amazing, they're achieving something new. Who do you, do you credit the guy who did the storyboards or the original art direction? Do you credit the, even the team who came up with the suits or how the suits coordinate with the background? There's probably a couple guys in charge of just making sure continuity wise, the suits and the backgrounds mixed together. Mm -hmm. The person or not even person, but team in charge of textures on the 3D models the people who do the 3D models. I mean, we're talking about hundreds, if not in a, in a movie today, tens of thousands or maybe even hundreds of thousands of people mm -hmm. between all these companies working on one film. It kind of drives me nuts. I'm curious people's thoughts on that. Uh, double feature show at gmail.com. So I know it's been a very tangential conversation, mm -hmm. but one of the reasons we wanted to cover the original on this show is because uh, it's kind of getting swept under the rug a yeah, little bit. Right. You know, it's 20, what, 30 years old at this yeah, point now. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Disney comes out with this new movie and you would think maybe they really drag out the old Tron. They do a super deluxe edition box set. Remaster. And, yeah. Documentaries. Interviews. And in fact, Disney seems like they were trying to sweep the original Tron under the rug, despite the fact that legacy was made by people who clearly love the original. There's uh, a lot of people coming back. Jeff Bridges, especially who... It's just my new fucking favorite thing ever. I don't know why, but, you know, it started with The Big Lebowski, and just from there, it's snowballing. Mm. Uh, Jeff Bridges is just awesome, and I, I love him. And you know what? I even love CG, Jeff Bridges. That whole thing. I think it's great. So the new movie makes all those references back to the old one, maybe to the point where it's just ripping the old one off, mm -hmm. like ending your movie with a really long train ride. That's okay to do. It's just such an odd phenomenon because usually that's not how it's done. Usually you drag that original one out and you milk it as hard as you can. You do the, uh, and you see that a lot with trilogies, especially something that starts a little obscure. Um, Evil Dead, the, uh, the success is exponential as the series goes on. Mm -hmm. uh, the Mexico movies, yeah. you know, Desperado becomes big. Once upon a time, Mexico is huge. Nobody knew what mariachi is. And so they package those together in box sets and they do crazy stuff with that. 
Um, there's additional commentaries and stuff that wouldn't exist otherwise. Even the Sergio Leone stuff, I mean, Fistful of Dollars is not the good, the bad, and the ugly. That's true. You know, that's uh, probably the most popular film of that trilogy, but they don't try and pretend Fistful of Dollars doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. It's just so strange to me. Understandable, but something I've probably never seen um, a, a movie production company do. I guess Disney's done that with some of the stuff they're afraid of, because Disney is really uh, concerned about their PR. Mm -hmm. You know, they're concerned about who puts Mickey Mouse where. Yeah. It reminds me of that, uh, that Marilyn Manson thing with the Mickey Mouse right. ears, you know, just defiling Disney's copyright. But they're really particular about where the mouse goes. They're really particular about old movies they want to erase from their history because maybe the era the movie came out in wasn't, let's say, racially sensitive. Mm -hmm. And so it makes sense that Disney might try and say, hmm, old Tron, a little embarrassing. Let's pretend that didn't happen. Well, and another thing that happened in pop culture that society seems to pretend never happened is Scott Pilgrim. Oh, yeah. The whole movie, Scott Pilgrim <laughs> versus the world, did not happen. That movie came out. It came out the same weekend as The Expendables and that Julia Roberts thing. Doesn't need to get tagged. But Don't give a shit. essentially, nobody went to the theater to see Scott Pilgrim. It was a huge flop. And as far as I'm concerned, it was the best thing that's come out not only last year, but like in the past five years. I was just fucking steamrolled by that movie. Yeah. yeah, I have not been that blown away. Just overwhelmed second by second by mm -hmm. a movie in a long time. It's just a, uh, it's a constant assault of stuff. Sure. And there's the surprise factor there too, because yeah. there was a lot of advertising pumped into that movie. Mm -hmm. I've heard it. It's not like I had no idea what Scott right. Pilgrim was. Right. You knew it was, was Edgar Wright. You knew yep. all the actors that were in it. It yep. was no surprises. I knew what the premise of the movie was. I'd even seen the trailer. And yet I hadn't seen the movie, along with apparently the rest of the known universe, right. had not seen the movie. And there didn't seem to be the kind of buzz afterwards. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's part of the mass exodus of double feature doesn't like video games thing. That could be. I think it's finding more of a following now that it's, you know, the home video market. Maybe these people just don't like going mm -hmm. to theaters. You know what happened is they took people's arcades out of movie theaters. Yeah. And that's what's going on there. So let's just start at the beginning. Give me a little background. We have some actors in this movie that need a mention. Yeah. So I think first and foremost, we should talk about Scott Pilgrim, who's played yeah. by Michael Sarah. And as far as I'm concerned, Michael Sarah is not a good actor. Sure. He is fucking great in this movie. Yeah. He is absolutely perfect for the role. I've never seen him in anything else that I liked him in. He Arrested Development, right? He, but that was before I knew that that's all he could do. Sure. When he was in Arrested Development, that was fresh, that was new, that was funny, and then he recycled that until now. But I think you'll agree with me then to say that uh, Scott Pilgrim is ending that is all Michael Sarah can do. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. clearly, whether he chooses to or not, he can't. he is capable of of other things. It's some pretty fucking amazing things. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I wouldn't say he's unrecognizable because you see Michael Sarah mm -hmm. so often, his face just screams Michael Sarah. Yeah. But uh, just the character he's playing, the person he is, we keep waiting for these movies. You know, when we see someone like Michael Sarah, every movie that comes out is almost pitched as. Hey, look at Michael Sarah. He's doing something new. He has a even, mustache. He even had that fucking movie where he, there's two versions of him and one is a mustache. Uh -huh. I mean, they're just desperately trying to say, this is Michael Sarah, but not like you know him, mm -hmm. not like you've ever seen him before. And Scott Pilgrim wasn't trying to exploit that at right. all. It didn't come out and say, Scott Pilgrim, the movie where Michael Sarah does something interesting. Right. But it was the movie where Michael Sarah sure. did something interesting. And he's not the only one in it. So we have Jason Schwartzman, uh -huh. who plays Gideon, the final boyfriend. Yeah. Um, Brandon Routh sure. is the vegan boyfriend. He was Superman in Superman Returns. Chris Evans is boyfriend number two, I believe. Yeah. He's uh, Captain America. He's Fantastic Four. And then there's Bill Hader, who I don't want to overlook, uh -huh. um, who I thought at the time was Will Arnett, but is actually yeah. Bill Hader. And that voice is just amazing. Yeah. That good, somewhere between exploitation sure. voice and arcade voice, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Brilliant. Allison Pill, who plays Kim, who's my favorite character in the movie. She's yeah, the Kim's drummer. Kim's got some great She's stuff. She's absolutely here. the funniest character in the yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. For me, for me. Um, and then the actor that plays Knives, Knives' character sure. is amazing. Uh, his roommate, Cul uh, Macaulay yeah. Culkin's brother, I think it's Rory Culkin, right? Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, he's uh, he's absolutely hilarious in this film, too. And then we also have uh, Thomas Jane and Clifton Collins Jr. Who's Thomas Jane? Thomas in? Jane was one of the vegan cops. Oh, really? I didn't yeah. recognize him. Yeah. <laughs> so when I said I was overwhelmed by this movie, I literally meant that. I, uh, as I'm watching this thing, I just didn't know what to do with myself. Uh -huh. You know, remember, okay, so we did Enter the Dragon not too long ago, a couple weeks or whatever. And we were talking about the fight scenes and how, you know, 
didn't know anything about fighting or about dance, about choreography, and how they needed to be in slow motion to appreciate that. And that's actually how I felt about Scott Pilgrim. Mm -hmm. I needed to just slow the movie down so I could take this in. And this is an art form I actually understand. This is editing, which if there's any part, I know I talk lighting and shit all Mm -hmm. the time because that's stuff I'm learning now. But if there's anything I understand, it's sound and editing. Those are the only two jobs I've ever done on film anything. I do the editing for our show. I've been doing it every single week for three fucking years. Mm -hmm. I get editing and I love it. And this movie is throwing so much shit at me, I didn't even know where to start. It was uh, it was completely overwhelming. Sure. Well, it's super fast-paced. It's Edgar Wright, who is notorious for his quick cuts, especially sure. when he's setting something up, apparently not tying a shoe. That was great, too. Yeah. That's... That was great that finally we get those Edgar Wright suiting up, and it's a shoe tying, and we take time uh-huh. to relax for it. Right. But the whole film is incredibly fast-paced, down to, the, down to even some of the shooting, not even the editing, where... They'll do a pan and somebody will change their clothes immediately. It'll cut from one person back to another person sure. in a conversation. And they're on, the, they're on the street walking at this point. They're no longer in the practice room. They're no longer right. even on the street. They're in a club now. And it's all during the course of a single conversation. The great stuff we talked about with Eternal Sunshine or with Confessions of a Dangerous yeah, Mind. Absolutely. Those, uh, those sort of on the set practical effects or stuff done in editing to make it look like it's a smooth transition right from that last scene. I'm watching this thing as if I've never seen the craft of editing before. Mm. I mean, it's throwing so much at me that I just feel like it's a new component of filmmaking. Everything's been in mono up until now, and I'm just hearing stereo for the first Uh fucking time. And it's hard to talk about these things specifically on Double Feature because there's something notable and interesting. I mean, literally every few seconds. I'm not kidding. When the movie starts, and it starts to use some of the same stuff over and over, and it's okay. I mean, it's totally fine you get a little bit more used to it. But when you're seeing every single one of those ideas, the first time you see writing on the wall, Mm -hmm. the first time you see someone's character stats, uh, the first time a lot of that stuff happens, the P meter, the fucking P meter. uh, There's just, it's too much. There's just so it's not too much. It's fucking perfect. But I mean, there's so much that I can't even comprehend. I feel like I have to pause it maybe every 10 or 15 seconds to write something down. Mm -hmm. And so we're dealing with, you know, music video, fast editing and variation. That's an important part, too, that we're not just cutting from thing to thing to thing. Uh, We're using a lot of variation in the type of edits we make, in the type of effects that they're using. You know, they're all unique and they're very clever. There's almost a joke to each of the it's like writing, uh, you know, one liner after one liner, Mm -hmm. just punchline, punchline, punchline in the editing. The amount of work and more so precision that goes into a single good edit, nonetheless, a good edit every 10 seconds. Right. It's really astonishing. And that carries over in a lot of the fights, too. But, I mean, I could also do fucking 20 minutes on lighting. And yeah. fear not, I won't bore you with that. But uh, the way it's used uh, specifically in the beginning in transitional elements yeah. to move from one place to another or the empty darkness with mm-hmm. the spotlight or when sure. they're shutting the, the lights off. Uh, the scene where right before the the power goes out at the party mm-hmm. thing or what it's a party they're at yeah. right when that the, when the yeah. light shuts off and they kind of make a gag out of that but also the color gels on lights which especially in a comic book movie or a video game movie uh, not something you see very often because it's really easy to make you know color gels color lighting to look hokey mm-hmm. but you have it used uh, there's a really subtle one in the record store where she blows the pink you know the yeah. pink love thing and it changes kind of the lighting of the store and you only see that gag once i mean it's not something they repeat although it clearly took time to create and set up and Mm -hmm. put together and could they deserve to be able to use that over and over but they use it once yep it's one trick you leave your audience wanting more you never see it again and you have that same lighting a little bit more harshly in the vegan police scene with the green lighting or the stage lights on the you know the amp versus amp battle of the bands thing the red lighting on the final fight and it's just such a distinct look. It's it's fucking amazing. I really like it. I like the comic book titles too, the bubbles. Sure. Um, I think the best place that's probably used, you know, they make jokes out of some of that stuff too, but uh, during the Battle of the Bands, when they're yelling the subtitles, you can barely yeah, hear anything. Right. It's great because in a movie, this is such a good idea. You can never hear anything at concerts yeah. and nightclubs. Right. I've yet to see a movie where I feel like the mix is very true mm-hmm. unless you can't tell what the characters are saying. And I think, you know, here it's a comedy, so we can get away with a lot of the, the stuff that might even be a little cheesy. Yeah. 
But I think all movies should just start. I hear I'm going to advocate for subtitles. Just start putting subtitles over your concert band things. That sounds like a good idea. It's just or make the characters scream at each other that they can't hear each other mm-hmm. and leave. Uh, but the the fact that they make a joke out of that is awesome. So there's a lot of video game references in here. Well, they use they use a lot of the even the score from the Zelda games. They eight bit the universal theme at the, in the That's intro. That's amazing. Which is the best setup for the movie that you could ever ask. How do you for? not love the movie right when it starts? Yes. Yeah. And then they use the universal again yeah. in one of the fights, right? Uh, where you get—I always have trouble with the timing on mm-hmm. the drums. I don't know if you can do that, but oh, I can it's, never it's get tough. it. It's tough. I don't know where the fuck. Like, there's no kind of beat leading up to that, I guess. But um, the way they sync the movements in that fight or in the preparation of that, right to those drums, it's awesome. Mm-hmm. And you're waiting for that in the beginning too, as it. You know, as you first see the 8-bit Universal logo and you're hearing the sound, I'm thinking, oh, I hope they do something with the drums. And they have these, this great bit crush thing. Yeah. Oh, it's perfect. Yeah, they do a lot of other video game reference stuff, too. The the life is a really huge... Sure, sure. I mean, that's a plot point. Yeah. Where he uh, he gets a one-up. Right. The other one that's really good is when he gets the pulls the swords out of his chest. Sure, you sure. see his stats go up. Right. Gideon's stats will go up. Yeah. Uh, all this kind of the the verses that shows up in between sure. the people who are going to sure, fight. That's fight a stuff. classic fighting game. Yeah, the, the continue at the very end right. of the movie. I love uh, that they're using stuff straight out of Zelda rather than making uh, photos of you right. for Zelda. They're really using the Zelda stuff, especially that arrangement they use. I don't remember what part of uh, you've played Zelda. What's oh, a, yeah. what's the fucking the part where they have. The fairy, Are, the fairy fountain. Yeah, that's exactly the one yeah. I'm talking about. Yeah, where they have this great arrangement it's for when, it in the it's movie. It's when uh, he's in the hallway of the sc- of the classroom. Sure. And it starts 8-bit, and then he goes out, and it's all coral, and she's yeah, yeah, yeah. standing outside his door. Right, something that the movie decided to create based on a previous work. It's just giving a gift. to. It's beyond saying, hey, you played Zelda, you like Zelda, that's cool, let's put the theme in here. They're recreating pieces from Zelda in a way you've never heard them before. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. It's just this present to an audience they're already clearly pandering yeah. to. But then the coins. The coins are one of my favorite oh, right. things. Every time, you know, he kills somebody, there's an explosion of coins. The uh, the coin outlines at the ending. And what I really love, we haven't uh, we haven't dropped the C word once yet. Uh-huh. Not cunt, which is a word I don't say nearly enough on the show. But Canada. Right. They're Canadian coins. And I, so I lived in Canada very briefly for maybe four or six months or something. Mm-hmm. And so the Canadian references are awesome down to who's a Canadian and an American in the movie because they all fucking look like Canadians or the CN Tower stuff or just the jabs they make at Canada. But I remember one of the weirdest things about living there was they didn't have one or two dollar bills. You know, a five dollar bill was the lowest they had. Mm-hmm. And they had these weird looking coins um, for the, you know, the one and two. And so you see that at the very end, it's the first time you get a close-up glimpse. Right. And of course, they're in Canada, so it's all Canadian coins, which right. is just hilarious to me. One of the other things that's great is they have the Canadian band in there, or uh, the band that's just in Canada, I guess, Clash right. of the, what is it, Clash, Clash of the Demon of Head? Demon Head. Yeah, and I think I actually saw that band about a hundred times while I was in Canada. Yeah. I don't know if it's just the time I was there or the kind of shows I was seeing. They're playing with the Birthday Massacre all the uh-huh. time. Just different variations of that band. It, of course, wasn't literally the band from the movie. Right. And it wasn't even the same band every time. But I think every act that ever opened for the Birthday Massacre was that fucking bad. Ba- to the point where when the band started playing, I kind of went, oh, I know this song. Yeah. Or I recognize uh-huh. the singer. Or, something, or it sounds like fucking Jackalope or something. Mm-hmm. And I couldn't tell. It's just that one goddamn Canadian band. Well, that's the, the band thing is the second big part of the film that I identify with. The first part oh, being sure. video games. Yeah. And the second part is the, the small... So, small time band. Yeah. And, right? and I mean, it can be summed up in the fucking scene where they they get invited to open for the Clash at Demon Head. Sure, and they're sure. playing a secret show before their big show at wherever. It doesn't really matter. But they invite Sex bob yeah. to open for them. And who the, does the sex bob music, by the way? Oh, yeah. All the sex bob music is Beck. That's awesome. With like a broken bass. And the idea of forcing a professional, well-known band to play with shitty instruments or an artist to play with. Yeah. I think that would be great if by everybody's fifth album, they have to just use shit instruments. Yeah. They have to use a crappy, sure, beat up microphone that was found backstage. Nobody wanted after a gig in a rundown uptown alley. Mm-hmm. They have to use a distorted bass. It's probably not even a distorted bass, but just one with a broken speaker. Yeah. And just these these fucking trash can tin piece of shit drums. Mm-hmm. 
and the songs are still cool. Oh yeah, it's, great. it just shows they're off perfect. that it's kind of when you know bigger bands start doing acoustic sets mm-hmm. just to show off their songwriting skills. I think they should just keep with the grunge stuff yeah. and instead do sets with yeah. broken bullshit instruments. But anyway, there's this scene where they're talking about having this secret show mm-hmm. and Scott doesn't want to open for his ex-girlfriend. It says, why don't we have our own secret show? And Kim says, <laughs> all of our shows are secret shows. Sure. Of course they are. That is the embodiment oh, of being in a small time upstarty band, yep. which I've been in 30 of in yeah, my sure, lifetime. Sure. Uh, it's every, every show is a secret show. You have one guy that thinks you're really huge. Right. And then you have the real, it's always the drummer too. The drummer's the realist who puts down every big right. ballooned idea that the singer might have. Right. And it's just, it's so accurate how you practice in some guy's living room and that guy's not in your band, but yeah. he's, he's at all the shows right. on stage sure. for no reason. You've definitely had the one guy. You oh, might've yeah. had two guys who I weren't think in your I've band I've had that multiple times. I can think of them by name. I won't say it because that would be mean. I do remember a guy in your band who played video games at yes. some point. Well, like that, that mean, was his instrument, right? That was, Is yeah, he played sure. a video that's, game on stage. That was Scott Pilgrim in a nutshell. That whole my when the video gamer was in my band, yeah. that was when my band was just a blueprint for Scott Pilgrim. Minus the fighting. Oh god, you brought me into fighting and I didn't even get to talk about Gloom Rock or Sadcore. Oh yeah. Oh, that's a shame. Well, another show for another day, I guess. Little jokes like that, I mean, just odd small things to catch. This movie seems like it's probably littered with about 100 trillion Easter eggs, Uh um, even in just the sound stuff. But uh, during the fights, all throughout the movie, you have sound stuff from uh, various mobile devices or computer platforms, probably every variation of system from every era, whether Mm -hmm. it's a video game machine or a beaten, you know, Windows 95 startup calendar alarms there's dial the up. classic uh dial up stuff the mac startup on there this sounds amazing in the fights too maybe the it's just the theme is that what you're talking about uh, no i wasn't talking about that one god the music and the sound in this fucking movie that whole scene is amazing that whole seinfeld fucking stupid scene i'm sorry i've it. derailed you you're talking about the fights here right right yeah and so that's where you get a lot of the word bubbles you get a lot of the uh the coins flying out mm-hmm. you get a lot of the action when we talked on Equilibrium about how they realized glass shattering made the violence more violent, uh-huh. here it's just coins flying around. Sure. It's that same metal sure. hitting pavement right. sound, and they're using it here to make violence more brutal, even though it's really cartoony. Well, and the other thing that the fights do that, that is really effective is they do they use a lot of anime fighting techniques yeah, yeah. where the character is positioned in the frame. They're not moving, but they're the background static. is a blur, yeah, right. and their hair is flaring and their fist is out, and you know, they're in your head, they are soaring at a high sure, rate sure. of speed, ready to punch somebody, which is, that's probably my favorite aspect of all the fighting, is that there's this anime sensibility about it, which I don't even really like anime, but putting it in real real life. Yeah, it's the comic book stuff, sure. right? I mean, before it was anime, it was manga or manga, or however you pretentiously want to pronounce that. And it's just to celebrate, because Scott Pilgrim is, after all, a, graphic a comic novel. book, a graphic yeah. novel. One that I don't think had even finished as a series yeah, before didn't. the movie came out, which is awesome. And you you hear, uh, you know, as he's replaying his second life, mm-hmm. the guy makes the reference to how the movie is never as good at the comic yeah. book. And I just want to shake that man's hand yeah. as he walks by. Uh, that whole scene and he comes in and kicks ass. Not just that fight, but all six of the seven X's sure. fights. They do cheat a little bit by kind of combining one yeah. into a fight. But I mean, normally a movie with seven boss battles. Three. Would have three real battles and four, did I add that up right? Yeah, you're right. And four fluff bullshit battles. Mm-hmm. That end with a conversation, that end with a single move, or that just happen off screen. Yeah, right. One that maybe you throw away as a joke, and because the joke was really funny, you know, you push someone off a cliff, and they that ends the battle. They fall off a cliff, or they have a heart attack. Sure, want to go back is. to the child's play, kill a palooza. But I mean, really, the closest you get to that is skateboarding to death. Yeah. Or, uh, but that's I, after a fight. It is after have, a fight. He throws it is. Scott at the castle before right. that. Oh, that's awesome, and too. The thing at about- the castle. Well, and you also get away with that because you're then doing uh, a call out to the, the Tony Hawk games, uh-huh. the skate game, or what I always love, the um, SSX tricky games, the amped kind of games, where you're accumulating points, mm-hmm. kilometers, of course, because it's fucking Canadian, yeah. as he's going down the ramp. I love that. And then you also get the thing. So the, the thing that we briefly mentioned is that there's kind of a cheating moment where you lump two of the X's together and they're the Asian DJ twins. Yeah, right. They're Daft Punk, essentially. But that immediately 
gets quashed as being a cop out when it's a battle between the double dragon right. and a fucking garbage beast. They give you more than you sign up it's for. It's absolutely better. I mean, I'm it's at that point I'm willing it's as if they went, "Do you want to see two individual boss fights or do you want to see a double dragon fight a garbage beast?" Right. And right. I immediately opt for, you know, the second option. But I think they give you more than that in the final battle too. Sure. Not only do you get to see the battle twice, but then the girls are fighting mm-hmm. and then there's a team thing that happens. Yep. So you do really get seven fights out of the oh, movie. You might least. get more. Yeah, sure. you might get, and each fight well, is even unique fights, in its own way. Well, he even fights the the lesbian chick twice, right? Before right. he makes her come by tapping her underneath. Weird. And they're brutal. They're amazing. They're the fantastic. choreography is really great. The Michael Sarah is really great. Everybody in the fight. The is, side dialogues, even when people yeah. pipe in, uh, his roommate. Oh, yeah, go fight. Here we go. Yes, I love that. All the stuff on the balcony. Everything adds to it. None of it is ever filler. None of it ever takes away from anything. It's all just constantly making the. If you're overwhelmed by the first frame, by the end, I don't know how you could be anything less than uh, blown the fuck away. I don't know how people. You know, I can think back to so many shows where I ended. I don't know how people aren't talking about this movie. That's how I feel. Also, briefly, Glitchy Boss looks awesome. Congrats, film. Thanks. Do, 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 do. All right. So there's a website, doublefeatureshow.com. There is an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. And uh, we have an iTunes. So you can leave a little comment daily on there. Aside from Facebook, the only other thing we ask is donate.doublefeatureshow.com. So there's usually two reasons you should donate, but uh, today there's three reasons okay. you should donate. One, of course, is uh, the subscription payments. Those people all get a little vocal sample. We're going to take a sample from your voice and put it in our stupid intro thing with the last show 8-bit of the keyboard. And awesome, totally awesome. The other thing is that uh, you can send us your recommendations for movies, and we're going to pick two of the movies people recommend, put them together on the show. The third reason is that we have another Killapalooza coming up next time on the show. That's right. We're going to we're gonna do uh, one of those. It, we're going back to the 80s. Sure. Being born in the 80s. But I didn't we're gonna, know it was an 80s one. I gonna, had no idea oh, about yeah, that. Oh, yeah. Starts in the 80s, but it wraps in 2008. Oh, beautiful, sir. So we, but it's only five films. It's actually only four films, but we're not even going to discuss that until next week. Uh, if you can get your hands on all four of the five films, Sleepaway Camp films. Yeah, Sleepaway Camp. We're going to be in for a really good time next week. If you can get your hands on all five of the five Sleepaway Camp films, I... Watch more fucking film. Bye.